Welcome. Welcome to a place of progress that may not be perfect, but is determined to move forward. We are Relentless Church. Christy messes with me because I always tell her, like, I, unless God tells us to do something specifically, I don't want to do it. And it comes off sometimes as laziness, like, well, if God has to tell me for me to do it. And it's not that. It's that I think when you read, specifically in the Bible, when you read God tells people to do something, it gets done in, like, record time and in ways that you couldn't possibly predict. I think about, like, Nehemiah. God says, hey, person that has no experience whatsoever building walls and restoring cities who's never even been to the city themselves hey i want you to be the guy who's in charge of rebuilding the entire wall of jerusalem and not only will you do it and will you complete the project you'll complete it in like 57 days which is unheard of and so it's like not only did god do it he did it in a way and in a time frame and with resources that made no sense whatsoever and yet it got done and so anytime i can tell people like unless god tells us specifically to do it i don't want to do it that's why it's, it's just because like stuff like this, like in less than a week, there's like 40 people that regularly attend here. And it was like, oh yeah, we'll just slap together an amazing like turnout of stuff, you know, or uh, just crazy stuff like that happens when God is involved with it. And so um, it, it was funny because it speaks to what we're talking about today, but just remind yourself sometimes that sometimes we spin our wheels and we get ourselves so frustrated and so caught up in stress and tension and all this and anxiety about a given situation. And you have to stop and go, did God ask me to do this? You know what I mean? Like, I, sometimes the, the biggest source of stress and frustration in your life is a good idea, but not a God idea. It's something that you thought, hey, you know what I should probably do? And it's like, well, you know, wisdom, logic may suggest that, but let me check with God first. Maybe that very situation that you are the most stressed out about is not inherently bad. It's just, oh my God. And you're finding yourself struggling to find the resources or find the energy or find the patience maybe to finish it out and God's like why don't we just set that on hold for a little bit which kind of ties into what we're talking about today uh, we started this series last week called the sudden snap everybody snap those of you who can't snap you just got called out I'm so sorry that we've pointed you out maybe you can put the slide up there for the very first one can you can you snap right can anybody snap left too no, who can snap both? Everyone can snap both. Yeah. I can't nice. And then some of you are not coordinated. You're like, I don't, my fingers don't work that way. I'm so sorry. You're the handicapped snappers in the room, I guess. But we started this, I don't know if that's handy snappers? That feels like a way that, I don't know, that's just mean, I think. The sudden snap is what we're talking about. And what, the reason we brought this, or the reason it's called this, the reason we're talking about this is because when you go through the Bible and you read different sections of Scripture, God has this way of doing things that the Bible often phrases it like, and suddenly. Have you ever been reading something in the Bible, maybe? You're reading a story, and, you're, and you know things are going along, and you're reading, and then it says, and suddenly, right? One of the most famous and suddenlies is in the uh, book of Acts chapter 2. It's referred to as the upper room, the day of Pentecost. They're all together in one place. And then it says, and suddenly they heard what seemed to be a sound that sounded like the blowing of a violent wind. And this is when the Holy Spirit shows up for the very first time. It's this crazy outpouring and experience. But the end suddenly is always interesting to me because you have a group of people that are in that specific room, have been there for a week and a half, and are waiting on God to show up. So it's not as if they're unexpected. This is the whole purpose that they're there. And yet, suddenly it surprises them and happens, Right? You know, like you go to places, you're oftentimes expecting certain things. If you're going to the bank, you don't walk in and go, and suddenly there was an ATM. Like, no, you expect there to be an ATM, right? You don't walk into Trailblazer Grill Monday through Saturday, and, and suddenly they were serving food. No, they were serving food. Like, you would expect that. It doesn't surprise you. And yet, in the upper room, you read, and suddenly the Holy Spirit shows up. That's the entire purpose that 120 plus people had been there for 10 days, and yet it surprised them. And there's these moments throughout Scripture that things happen that they've been there. That's the purpose of them being there. And yet, 
it catches them off guard. It's the sudden snap. It's We talked about last week creation and how God created the world, but it went from nothing into something in a snap. We talked about how, you know, you can believe in the Big Bang Theory, but I just believe that the source of the Big Bang Theory is different, right? I believe that, the, you know, you guys know the old phrase, God said it, and bang, it happened. Big Bang Theory. Just give yourselves a hand for enduring that joke. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. The rest of you. For me. Thank you, Chris. God's sudden snap process is what we're talking about. And so this whole thing uh, carries on. There's this tension. There's this nervousness. There's this growing uh, frenzy almost sometimes to a certain time or a certain period with God. And it's like things are almost about to break free. Have you ever been in that moment where you're like, it's almost, almost time. It's almost like if you're, you know, if you're New Year's Eve and you're watching the thing and you've stayed up. Some of you, that's a chore to stay up till midnight, you know, and you're just like, it's almost there. We're five minutes out. It's, it's almost there. I'm not quiet. Anybody fall asleep in like the last three minutes? You can be woken up for midnight. Yeah. Clint, that feels like a good Clint stay up for sure. Long if that's how you're going to get your Right. Yeah. <laughs> Happy New Year. I'm awake barely, you know. So there's just moments like that where you're just almost there. And there's these seasons in life where it's like, I feel like I'm almost through this season. I'm almost done with this time period. This, this thing I've been praying for and believing for and expecting for and God has promised me is almost here. It's not yet, but it's almost here. And there's this anticipation, this excitement, but this tension. And that last few moments seem to stretch on forever, right? The, what, what feels like. An eternity is only a few seconds, and yet it feels like forever. It's like the last five minutes of a class in school feels like they are longer than the other 55 minutes of that class period. And students in the room said yes, and teachers in the room said yes. Yeah, and there's no, there's no greater like, like, like time frame, five minute time frame for me as a teacher than when I finished my lesson five minutes early, and I'm like, man, what am I going to do for the last five minutes to keep them occupied and it's, it's an eternity. It really feels like it. It goes both ways for students and teachers. It, it takes forever. But this is a picture that I want in mind for this series. is because there's these different aspects of God. These different um, roles that God plays. Not roles like bread. Roles like R-O-L-E-S that God plays. Some of y'all are like hungry and you just thought of like a dinner roll when I said bread. But there are these different roles. Sorry, if you weren't, and I just placed that in there. But, you know, you're welcome. <laughs> There's a tension to following God, right? Like faith and trust in God comes with this tension sometimes, with this anxiety. I'm not saying that following God creates anxiety, but sometimes we get ourselves in these situations where we're like, okay, God, like I trust you and it's great and I really love that you love me and you watch over me and all those great things. But right now, I just need you to come through because... I don't know what to do. Anybody ever got worked up like that with God? And it's not that he changed. It's just you got yourself in this frenzy, right? And sometimes it's almost as if God looks at you and is like, you did this to yourself, man. Like, I'm just saying this whole thing, maybe that's just me. I don't know. But there are situations I feel like God's like, what you're feeling now is all you. It's not me. And it's time we get, we get right about that time we start to worry is when it breaks, and it snaps. And it's this thing we've been praying for and believing for forever that we have expected. And yet it catches us off guard, that suddenly catches us off guard. Last week we talked about how God creates and how he created the world. And in creation, in studying how he created the world, there's this process of separating. The first three days of creation, he separates out where things go. And then the next three days, he fills what he just separated with what should be there. And how even in the New Testament, Jesus tells us to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and then everything else will be added. What he means is separate yourself out. Sort, let him sort out the places of your life, and then he'll put the things that need to be there. Um, sometimes our biggest moment of stress and tension, that sudden snap moment in our heart, is because we're not allowing God to lead. We're not allowing him to do the sorting and him to do the placing. We're just expecting that we should do that. This week, I want to talk about a, uh, an aspect of God and following God that, that really is not fun at all. I mean, look at the person next to you tell them, it's not fun. fun. I'm just prepping you because this week I want to talk about that God waits. God waits. There's a slide to go with that. There you go. Hey, God waits. Look at the person next to you and tell them, wait. Wait. And just hold it. Hold it. You don't have to tell them, hold it. Just hold it. Just wait a minute. Wait. All right? Just just hold. Just hold the wait. Just wait. Just wait. wait until it gets awkward. And then we can 
point out this awkwardness of waiting. Sometimes when we're following God, he just says, wait. And, and at first we're like, okay, yeah, I can wait. Sure. Yes. And then it's like, all right, but let's go. And then he's like, no, no, but wait some more. And they're like, okay, I love you, God. You're so good. Okay, now let's go. And he's like, no, no, no. Like, a little while longer. And a little while longer. And then after a while, you're almost angry. You know, like, God, I want you to lead me. He's like, I am. I told you to wait. And you're like, that's not leading. And he's like, no, but it is. Right? We, we often think that waiting is passive, is a lack of activity, is a lack of breakthrough. And honestly, sometimes God does the most work in us when he tells us to wait. There's this period of time between the Old Testament and the New Testament, roughly 400 years, that's referred to as the 400 years of silence because there's nothing written down scripturally about things God said in that 400 years. And yet, when you study that time period, you find out that more was done in that 400-year period on earth to set up what God would do in the New Testament. There was a reason why he said, wait. And in our lives, there is never... God just doesn't flippantly tell us to do anything, really, but he certainly doesn't flippantly tell us to wait. If he tells us to wait, there's a reason. And there's these moments in Scripture over and over again when we study the lives of these individuals we've been given where God says, just wait. Like, it's almost as if their story gets put on hold for a little while, and yet those are the times that propel them into where God takes them. It's weird like that. But God says sometimes to wait. Sometimes there's no greater tension or time to snap than when you were in the waiting room. Have you ever been sitting in the waiting room for something and you felt like you were going to snap? Yeah? Maybe you're waiting on a table at a restaurant, not Trailblazer, and it's just taking <laughs> forever. And you're like, I swear they've set four tables before me, and if they seat one more, I'm going to lose it, you know? And how many of you are like that confrontational person that's going to go talk to them like, excuse me, uh, we just noticed that four people. How many of you, none of you are rude, right? Like at all? No. No, because we're Christians, and you know we, we're not rude. Conversation for another day. Uh, maybe you're at the doctor's office, you know, and they, which I never understood why you schedule an appointment for a certain time and you get there on time and then you have to wait for thirty minutes. If you work at a doctor's office, I'm sorry. Explain it to me later, but I don't know why I had to schedule an appointment for say eleven a.m. I show up at ten fifty-five, and they're like, "Great, have a seat. We'll be right with you." And at eleven twenty, it's now. I'm like, "Why did we schedule this appointment?" Right. Just schedule me for 11.20. I would have been here then. I could have slept 20 minutes longer or something. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, there's something about waiting if you're stuck in traffic. Now, I'm from Houston, right? I understand traffic. I moved to Burnett. And at first, I was like, Burnett traffic's nothing compared to Houston. This is just easy. Until I've sat at that line a few times. And then I'm like, Burnett traffic's the worst, right? Because there's no reason there should be traffic. In Houston, it's like, all right, there's too many people, not enough roads, I get it. Out here, it's like, what is this? Can we move along a little faster? How many of you get frustrated here in Burnett with the traffic? Like, yeah. Now, Marble Falls is a whole different story. We work in Marble Falls, and at 5 p.m. in Marble Falls, I don't, I don't know what they're doing out there. And I look around, I'm like, y'all have the money. Why can't we figure this out? Like, just overpass it or something. I don't know, but it just drives me nuts conversation about traffic but it's annoying and it's tense and it's stressful and it's like especially if you've had a rough day and then you get stuck in traffic and then somebody cuts in front of you and or you know even like something as simple you ever been in the line at mojo mm -hmm. and a car comes around in that little middle one yes mm -hmm. some of y'all i just triggered you some of you i just triggered you because you've been sitting in that line the long you know you're four cars back and then here's this little cut in line line which why i don't know why they have that why would you put a line that inherently because allows people to come? And they're supposed to be honest. They're yeah. supposed to say, that "I'm after that car." That's yeah. what they're supposed to do, but people don't. So this has nothing to do with my message, but I felt like I needed to tell this story. <laughs> I'm in line the other day at Mojo, and I'm like four cars back. I've been sitting there for 10 minutes because it was like 5 o'clock, and everybody needs like second round of caffeine at 5 o'clock, I guess. Uh -huh. And so I'm sitting there, and this dude comes walking around on foot. Well, obviously walking on foot. And he's walking around on foot, and he walks into the Mojo parking lot and walks around to the side where you can walk up and kind of looks at it for a minute, and there's some people. And then he gets, uh, he just decides he didn't want to wait in line. So he comes over and he stands right behind my car. <laughs> and I was like, at first I'm like, what is he? Like, he's really close to the back of my car. And there's three or four cars behind me. I'm like, what is this guy doing? And he just stands there. And he's got a little dog with him. And at one point he like walks away and he tells the dog, stay. 
and he walks away. The dog never moves. I see it on my backup camera. It's it right there. He out? comes back. Uh, no, it's like a healer. Oh, okay. And uh, he, <laughs> healer, what was Australian blue healer? Not like a healer, you know, blue like healer. sleeping like mini <laughs> head or something. No. <laughs> That's a picture of the dog mini head. Anyway, it's how my brain works. Uh, and so anyway, he stands there, and I'm in line for 10 minutes, and it's just standing there, like a human in line for cars. Didn't want to stand in the human line. He got in the car line. And then I thought, if you're the guy behind me, the car behind me, how do you feel about this? Because not only did someone cut in front of you, but he's on foot. So I was it's just weird. I was like, is he really going to stand here the whole time? And in like, and so he did. I went up, got my drink, ordered, drove off, and I just had to stop and like look at him because he walked up to the window. I was like, hey, how's it going? And I was like, what just happened here? I guess. I mean, I don't really understand. This has nothing to do with God. I'm sure there's probably a spiritual truth deep within it. I mean, some people just aren't going to wait in the way that, I don't know. I'm trying to make it spiritual. It's not. It was just weird, and I had to tell you about it. I videoed it, but, you know. I, I did, because I'm sitting in line on my phone, and I was like, I, I have to witness it. So I, like, I'm like on my phone, and I'm like holding it up. And you can see the guy, and I'm like, there's a guy. in like, And then he realizes that I'm videoing him at one point, and he was like, <laughs> I may put it on TikTok or something. I don't know. I don't know why. And, and it has no spiritual deep meaning. So if that speaks to you in some way, maybe it does. But, you know, some people just do things differently. Wait differently. Um, he was waiting in the way he wanted to wait, I guess. There we go. Anyway, let me get back to the actual Jesus part of today. But waiting comes up a lot in Scripture. Now, sometimes it's not a good kind of waiting. There are a few instances in which um, the word wait or tarry is used, and it's not necessarily uh, God-led. For instance, uh, the very first time we read about the word tarry, it's in the book of Genesis, and it's when God sends two messengers, two angels, to Sodom and Gomorrah, and they're getting ready to destroy it. And Lot tells them, hey, wait here in the city. It does not go well. That type of wait, we don't have to get into the story, it's really weird, but that type of waiting almost always gets interrupted. It never, it never lasts as long as it's supposed to, and it usually has negative consequences. If you're in a period of waiting, and it's not God-led, it's not a place that uh, he's led you to, that's different. And that usually ends way quicker. We're not talking about that kind of waiting. We're talking about the God kind of waiting. And to me, while there's lots of different examples in Scripture of this word, the one that sticks out to me the most is Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 31. And if you got your Bibles, you can go there. It'll be up on the screen. Super popular verse. You've probably heard a song using these words. If you've seen Remember the Titans, they sing these words. I think the... Yeah. Or uh, Maverick City just did a song with these words. Actually, I think it's the one I was playing right there. Anyway. Um, it's a super popular verse. So, But I wanted to talk through it because not only does it talk about waiting, there's some things we can learn from this when you dig a little bit deeper into the, the actual truth, the, the meaning behind what these words meant to that first, first group of people listening to it. So let's read through the verse and then I'll break it down. It says, but they that wait, or they who wait for the Lord. And it depends on the version you have. Sometimes that says those that, uh, what do you have, Cassie? They that wait? Uh, does your say wait? It says, uh, Hang on, I flipped. Uh, but they who wait for the Lord. Yours says wait, okay. I, mine's ESV, though. Oh, that makes sense. So. Different versions will say different things, but wait is the word we're going. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Next one, Phoebe. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. All right, go back to the first verse, because I wanted to point out a few things that I think are interesting about this verse. That word wait is uh, the Hebrew word kava. You can say that one. Kava. Oh, that one's fun. Just, you gotta put some in it, you know, kava. I don't know why, but I feel like that's the, the Hebrew way to, pro I don't know, pronounce it, but it just sounds fun. Kava. Anyway, it's the same word wait as we see in Genesis 1, chapter 9. We just talked about chapter, or just 1, verse 9. We just talked about Genesis chapter 1 last week when God separates. In verse 9, the word, it's the verse where, or it's the part of creation where God separates the waters. And he separates the waters from the land and he creates separation, right, with land and water. That word, when he tells the waters to move to a certain place, that word is kava. That word is wait. Which I think is interesting because it's not so much like God is saying, hey, water, separate and stay there. It means wait there. As in there's an active, the water is constantly 
active. You think about waves and how it's constantly lapping up on the shore. It's almost as if the water is in a constant perpetual state of motion towards trying to take back that territory. Does that make sense? So when it says wait, it doesn't mean just like quietly wait. I don't know why I look like that, why I felt like I needed to cross my hands. It doesn't mean like a, I'll wait here for the Lord. It's an active, active, active state of waiting, right? The very waters of the earth wait in anticipation of moving forward. In Psalms, David uses this exact same word to talk about the active form of waiting. He says those that wait upon the Lord, and he's talking about his waiting was prayer, was fasting, was activity, was learning, was growing. So he doesn't mean wait as in sit quietly and do nothing. He means wait as in use this time to be active in your waiting. How active is your time frame of waiting? If God's got you in a period of waiting to see the, f- the promise fulfilled or a prayer answered, it's not a passive, just sit back and do nothing kind of waiting. It's a, what can I be doing here and now actively in this place he has me waiting? Does that make sense? Does it change your perspective a little bit? Because for me, it did. Because I can remember when Christy and I first got married, we had talked about, we both wanted to be, you know, in ministry. We both wanted to do the work for churches and stuff like that. And that's really what we felt called to. And yet we were in a season where God was like, I love that that's your vision. You're going to do that on the side. But from nine to five, Monday through Friday, you're going to make a living doing something else. And I can remember sitting in jobs that I really pretty much hated because I was like, this isn't where I want to be. And I'm just having to answer calls and sell things and do whatever, you know, customer service stuff thinking I'm just wasting my time waiting here in these seasons. Like, God, when is it going to be time for me to do what I actually feel like you want me to do? And it wasn't until years later that weird random things I learned in those jobs would pop up in the middle of doing ministry that God was like, hey, remember that random thing that you learned or did or whatever in that season of that job you absolutely hated? Hey, that wasn't on accident. Because the skills you learn there, you're going to learn and apply to this season. I can remember being at the church that we used to be at, Houston, right after Hurricane Harvey. And the church uh, that we were at there had the opportunity to be a, um, what do you call it, a distribution center for all kinds of relief supplies, right? So we have like 18 wheelers, half dozen 18 wheelers dropping off pallets worth of stuff at our church because where we were, we were kind of in the hood. And so it was like, hey, we can just like... We could just hand out stuff, you know. It was good. Sorry, that's where Ali used to live. So I was hey. like, that's fine. Calm down. Calm down. <laughs> that's why you looked at me like that. I was like, okay, class, I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, so we had this unique opportunity to hand out all these supplies, which was cool. But then we were placed in this moment where we're like, what do we do with all this stuff, right? Pallets worth of stuff. And lo and behold, the first job that I had was in a warehouse where I got forklift certified. There is no more useless feeling than knowing that I want to be in ministry full-time driving a forklift thinking, when am I ever going to use this at like 22, 23? And here I am at 31 driving a forklift in the church, organizing a warehouse worth of supplies thinking, God, did you do that on purpose? Like why in the world? What? What? Like there were just random things like that. I, my second like real job I ever had was I worked as a college counselor for a uh, for a, a university, and they sent me to a bunch of trainings on how to uh, ask questions and how to talk to people in order to. And it was really a salesy kind of thing, but the it was teaching people how to have effective conversations. And it was so crazy that sitting in my office a decade later, people would come in for counseling or come in to talk about whatever was going on in their life. And these techniques and stuff on how to communicate with people, how to get people to drive towards their root cause rather than just the things they say. All of these things that I learned that I thought, I will never use this again, are all of a sudden useful. Now, let me tell you, if you're in school and you're thinking, I'll never use this, that's probably true. Because there's a lot of things in school you will never use. You know, I don't need to know in my everyday life that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. But I know that. Yes, it is. Just because you teach science does not count. (laughs) That doesn't count. Uh, But these seasons of my life that I was like, God, why am I in this place? It feels completely pointless. Like I'm just passively and idly sitting by doing nothing. That I look back and I go, man, even when I didn't even want to be there, I was learning things that God would use in future seasons. And over and over again, there's these examples in scripture of these people who did what seemed like mundane things until all of a sudden they realized they weren't. They were actively doing the things, the, learning the skills, learning the, the, the 
lessons and gaining the experience they would need to be successful later in life. Not one single person in the Bible just listens to God, obeys, and shows up with no experience whatsoever and just does it. It's always this build-up pattern of God working in their life, whether they knew it or not. And so our waiting, that waiting here, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, is not passive. Now, the word renew is interesting because, uh, you know, renew in, in English just means like to refresh, to reset, to re reignite. Um, but that word in scripture is a little bit different because the word, the first time we read that word, it's talking about the story of Joshua, not Joshua, I'm sorry, Jacob, where Jacob is working for Laban. And we don't have to get into the whole like story there, but essentially he works for a certain reward and they keep changing the reward on him. Like every time he goes to show up to claim his reward or claim his wages or whatever, they just keep changing it. And if you ever like, if you ever like thought you won something and then they're like, oh, but wait, no, you didn't actually win that. Or, you know, you like, it'd be like showing up to collect your paycheck and they're like, well, so what happened was uh, what you thought you were making, you weren't actually making. Or if you ever got your first paycheck and then they took out taxes and you were like, who's FICA, right? Why do they get half of my paycheck? What just happened? You know what I mean? Like those, it's just, there's that feeling of, wait, this is not what, <coughs> excuse me, this is not what I thought it was going to be. That's the picture. That's the word renew. That's what it means. So what they're saying is those that wait upon the Lord shall renew, but not in the way they think. Oftentimes, the process of renewing your strength in the Lord does not look like what you think it does. In fact, his process of renewing your strength will most of the time be very different than you think. Like if I said, hey, I want you to take a few days and I just want you to renew your strength. What are you probably going to do? What would you do if I told you to take a few days and just renew your strength? Sleep. Sleep, right? What else? Eat. Eat. Okay. What else? Box somebody. Box? <laughs> I should have expected a weird answer from you. Okay, maybe. I mean, I guess you would grow stronger, maybe, or not. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. Those are our things that we equate with, with renewing strength, with, with passive, with rest, with, I, I just want to chill. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but that's not the way God sees it. God says renew your strength, and he doesn't mean sit around and do nothing. He means I want you to train and be active for something new, right? So when he says renew your strength, he's not saying sit around and do nothing. He's saying I want you to learn now the things you'll need later. That word strength uh, means produce your, your, what you produce or what you yield. The first time we read that word is when God is talking to Cain. And he's, he's using it as a negative. Cain, you'll no longer be able to produce or yield things from the ground like you used to. And so what God is saying is the strength is the ability to make things happen. So those that wait for the Lord will have their strength, their ability to produce, regrown or rechanged or strengthen or grown through him, but probably not in a way that you expect. Which tells us to go into this waiting period with the Lord, just trusting him. Because it's not going to be what you think it's going to be. Right? Have you ever been in a season with God? You're like, okay, God, I trust you. Let's do it. And then it is completely different than you thought. <laughs> Christy's laughing because it's happened to us a lot, right? Where you're like, God, yes, I trust you. It's going to be amazing. Lead us forward, Lord. Yeah, faith. And God's like, cool. So do this. And you're like, hold up. That's not, that's not what I thought we were going to do. Right? Uh, God, this doesn't look like what I thought it does. And he's like, well, you said lead you. And you said you trusted me. So why are you questioning it? Well, because it doesn't look like I thought it would. And how many times do we get ourselves worked up over God responding to our prayers? Just not in the way we thought. And God's like, well, you asked me to answer this prayer. You asked me to work in your life. You asked me to lead you and guide you and provide for you and bless you. Should I stop because you don't like it? Or because it caught you off guard? I mean, I'm, if he's God and I'm not, wouldn't you know better? Right? Is this making sense to you? Okay, good. Just check. Strength. Genesis. Produce. Yield. And then he says, so this is weird. So the first part is those that, re, those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. And then he goes into what it will produce or what it will look like. They will mount up with wings like eagles, which is kind of a cool, like, Anybody wanted to fly as a kid? Like, if, if you ever were asked, like, what your superpower you would want, it was fly. Which, I don't know how that would work in real life, but I, I'm 37. It would still be pretty cool. Yeah. 
definitely would beat traffic, you know, unless it's raining, I guess. I don't know. That would be fun. But they will mount up. Um, that word mount up is ascend, which makes sense. They would take flight, but it means to ascend or to take flight with being filled or lifted with life which I thought was kind of cool. In the same way that a bird, you know, if you didn't know anything about the way birds work, they spread their wings, but the, it's the draft that fills their wings, and that's what creates lift. Same with planes. Um, this is life, the life that comes from the source. It actually is the same word that's used to talk about rivers springing up from the ground to create new life, a new water source. So think about it this way. It's, it's when you rest in the Lord and you do things his way, life fills the wings of your life and you take flight, which is kind of cool, I think. Um, anyway, and then, so they shall mount up with wings like eagles. You need to go to the next one. They shall run and not be weary. So run is really interesting. Do you know what run means in Hebrew? Run. Run. Yeah, that's it. It doesn't mean anything. There's not like a deeper meaning. It, it, run means to run, like to run. It's pretty straightforward. I thought that was funny. Never mind. All right, run means to run. But walk is different. So walk does mean walk, as in take one step and move in front of the other. But that walk is used exclusively in Scripture to talk about people who walked with the Lord. Especially and initially Enoch. And if you know anything about Enoch in Scripture, there's two verses about Enoch in our recorded Scriptures that say one is his lineage, who he was, who his son was, who his father was. The next verse says Enoch walked with the Lord and then was with the Lord, or then the Lord took him. Here's a guy who the only thing really said about him is that he was so close and so in relationship with God that God was like, yeah, you're coming with me, right? And just like moved him on to heaven. Like, the, I don't know. That's pretty crazy, right? So that's Enoch. Or Noah, a man who walked the only person on the earth that was counted as someone who walked with the Lord. It, and that word walk means walking with the Lord. And the other cool thing is the only other way this word walk is used in Scripture is to talk about flow of rivers, which is weird. But when you think about it, what he's saying is when you learn to walk with the Lord, it should look like the constant and easy flow of a river. It should be a natural progression in your life. It shouldn't be work. It should be a flow, which I thought was kind of cool. Anyway, so let's put all this together because I think there are three things I want to point out in our last few minutes that we can take from this. Three things we can be doing in the waiting period. And that can be if you're waiting on a new job, that can be if you're waiting on a new season of your life, if you're waiting on a prayer to be answered, if you're waiting on all kinds of stuff, we get in these kind of holding patterns or waiting periods. And I think there's some things we can do. I think the first thing is we can watch. Watch. Who's the person next to you tell them watch. watch? Watch. You can watch. It's very easy. It talks about, uh, the verse before this talks about mounting up. One of the things you can mount up like eagles is you get a bird's eye view, right? You can oversee things. Jesus kind of gives this same parallel, not the eagle thing, but the watch in the Garden of Gethsemane in the New Testament. He tells the disciples, I'm going to pray. I want you to pray. And then he tells them, hey, watch and pray. So he's not saying, because what do the disciples do when he tells them to pray? They fall asleep, right? How many of you have been told to wait? And God's like, hey, just wait right here. And you fell asleep. I mean, if you've ever tried to get up early, like start a new routine, and I'm going to get up early and I'm going to pray. How many of you fell asleep? Nah, yeah, that's me. Like a lot. You know? Or... Uh, just have, how many of you, like, I know my dad is one. If he sits still for more than five minutes, he's going to fall asleep. Like, it's just a thing. We know. If, that, if he's over, if he sits on the couch, it doesn't matter if we're watching a movie. It doesn't matter if the kids are running around the room. It doesn't matter. He's asleep. And now I get it, being a dad myself, I just fall asleep for no reason. Christy, like, Christy loves when we watch things to, like, let's turn the lights down and let's make it like a movie theater. And I'm like, you can do that, but I will be asleep in three minutes tops doesn't matter how exciting the movie is. It's like my body's like, oh, we're sleeping now. <laughs> and I'm out, right? It's not that kind of wait. Some of us, when God says, wait, that's what we do. We like mentally or spiritually go to sleep. And he's like, no, 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 no. I need you to stay alert in your wait. I need you to watch and I need you to pray. And he tells the disciples this multiple times in the Garden of Gethsemane. Watch and pray this wait period because we know that he's waiting, right? It's the Garden of Gethsemane. What happens right at the end of it? They show up, they arrest him, and it starts the whole crucifixion process. It starts the essential execution process of his life. So he knows that this is a waiting season, right? He goes to the garden to essentially go, okay, I'm going to hang out here. 
until it's time to move forward with the wrap-up of this part of my life. So it's a waiting period, but he tells the disciples in this waiting period, don't just fall asleep. Don't just sit here and do nothing. Watch and pray. Sometimes the best thing we can do in the waiting season of our life is be watchful, is learn. Rather than keep our heads down and just drown out everything, go, what can I watch? What can I learn? What can I gain from this place? If it's a job that's not the job you want to be in, what can I learn now? Who can I help now? Who can I make a connection with or be Christ to or whatever now while I'm here? If I'm stuck in the doctor's office waiting for them to call my name, what can I do in the 15 minutes I might be there? I could play on my phone, sure. Or maybe I could be productive, you know, or maybe I could, whatever. Like, there's lots of things that if we try to recapture that time, rather than see it as idle, wasted, waiting time, go, what can I do to make this time work for me? And there's lots of times in scripture where this happens, where there's this time jump. You know, I think about the, I think about King David in the Old Testament. David is like a teenager. He's 13 to 15 years old, roughly, when he is anointed to be the next king of Israel. The prophet shows up, he anoints him, tells him, you're going to be the next king of Israel. David isn't actually king for 22 years after that. So there's a 20-year span where he kind of, I mean, he does some stuff, but can you imagine being told at 13, hey, you're the next king, and then 20 years later, you actually see that prayer, that promise, that vision come to pass. I mean, David had to wait 20 years for that. And sometimes when we have to wait two months for something, we lose our minds, right? Now, I'm not saying that your pain's nothing compared to his pain, but you understand my point. Sometimes when God says something will happen, it's, it's not, hey, it's going to happen right now. I'm setting you up for the future, so be active in what you do. And what we know about that 20-year period in David's life is he had to learn some stuff. He literally sat at the feet of the king, and he learned warfare. He learned politics. He learned strategy. He got the opportunity to learn all these things that he would later use as king. What are you supposed to be learning or doing or growing or preparing or building now that will propel you into what God has called you to be? What are you supposed to be watching for? Number two, the next thing we can do during the waiting is be present. Now let me explain what I mean by that. Have you ever been physically in the room but mentally you were checked out? Probably right now, some of you. But you know what I mean? Or like you're, you're in the room, you're sitting on a couch, you're watching a TV show with, with your family, but you are not thinking about that TV show, right? You're thinking about work, you're thinking about whatever, you're on your phone. Christy, this drives Christy crazy all the time because Christy's like, if I'm going to watch a movie with you, if I'm going to watch a show with you, get off your phone because I know that physically you're here, but mentally you're somewhere else, right? I want to laugh at the show with you. I want to enjoy the plot twists and go, oh, I'm shocked at the story. I don't know what that was, but you know what I mean? I want, she wants, if she's shocked at what just happened, she wants me to be shocked. And there's, you know, I, like, I get that. If I'm on my phone, I can kind of follow it. You know, I'll hear them laugh and respond to me. I'll be like, oh, yeah. And they're like, I, I have no idea why they're laughing, but I'm faking it to make her feel, you know what I mean? So be present. God even knows this about us. There's this moment in the Old Testament when God calls Moses up to the mountain and he wants to have a meeting with him, basically. He wants to impart wisdom into him. He's essentially going to give him the Ten Commandments. It's this crazy moment. But he calls Moses up on the mountain. And in that passage, he says, Moses, come up on the mountain. And when you're on the mountain, be on the mountain. And it reads very redundantly. Like, did God just stutter? Like, what? What? When you're on the mountain, be on the mountain. And it's like, well, duh, if you're on the mountain, you'll be on the mountain. And what the, the beauty of that verse is, is what God is saying is, when you're physically, well, by the time you get up to the mountain, don't think about how you got up here. Don't think about how you'll get back down. Don't think about what's going on at the base of the mountain with your people while you're up here. When you're up here physically, be mentally and spiritually up here. When you're in here physically, be mentally and spiritually in here. When you're in here spiritually, physically, be mentally and physically in here. You understand my point. Sometimes we are physically in a waiting period, but we are mentally light years away. Yeah. Or spiritually, we are completely checked out. And God's like, hey, I love that you're going through the motions, and I love that physically you're in church on Sundays, but if you're not mentally or spiritually here, you are missing it. 
God is not just a God of, of meeting physical needs. Go look at any person that Jesus heals in his time here on earth. He does not just heal them physically. He heals them mentally and spiritually. We can have a whole conversation about that. But God is a God of healing us on all three fronts. He is a God of communicating with us on all three fronts. So if you're in the waiting period, be present. Tiffany, you have a question? No, I don't have a question. Okay, he's My waiting. My foot healed without a scar. Nice. A second degree burn healed without a scar. Without a scar. And that's what he said there and said was going to happen. Yeah? yeah? Cool. There you go. Let's Sorry, just like... Frank like <laughs> That's awesome. She just said her foot was miraculously healed. I think we can clap. Right? Like, oh, cool. Way to go. Like, you guys just have miracles that often in your life that you're like, oh, yeah, it's a big deal. Oh, right? Cool. I'm just like, yeah, cool. shut off a miracle. All right. We'll just move on there. We'll talk about it next week. We'll talk about miracles because we got to talk about it. All right. So number two, be present. We can be present mentally, spiritually, physically present. And nobody knows this principle better than parents. If you've been physically in the room, and then mentally you're not, and your kids keep saying your name, mom, 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 and you're like, what? And it's because they realize it takes three moms to get your attention because you are mentally checked out. Just saying. All right. It happens to me, too. I play Legos with my son, and about three dads in, I'm like, what? What's going on? And he's like, right, where are you at, man? I paying attention. He didn't actually say that, but I know he's thinking it. Be present, number two. So in the waiting period, watch. Be present, number three. Remain hopeful. Look at the person next to you tell them hopeful. hopeful. And the reason I have you look at the person next to you is because sometimes the only way you remain hopeful in the waiting period is with the person next to you. Is having someone else in your life that says, hey, remain hopeful. Because it's not as bad as you think it is. It's not as boring as you think it is. It's not as terrible as you think it is. It's going to be amazing. You're doing great, sweetie. It's going to be wonderful, right? Sometimes that's why we come together in this place. It's not just because we all like to get together and make, I mean, maybe we do. I don't know. But my point is that we need other people in our life to help us on our journey, especially in the time periods when we feel like we are stuck and waiting and it feels like it's never going to end. That's when you need someone who has maybe been a little further than you in life or who is maybe a little more naive in life, they can just say, it's going to be great, right? <laughs> Sometimes you don't even need the depth of experience of someone deep, you know, wisdom imparting. You just need someone who goes, everything's wonderful and you are doing so great. I love you, right? Some of you have that gift. You're just so encouraging and even blindly and that's okay too. Like that's a wonderful thing. Sometimes you need someone to help you remain hopeful. There is a despair sometimes that shows up with the waiting season. Think, will it ever end? In those moments, think about what or who keeps you hopeful. Because it always comes to an end. It's never in the time frame we think it's going to be. It's either way longer than we think it's going to be, or sometimes way quicker. It's a sudden snap. And it never looks exactly like we think it is going to look. It's almost 100% better, but weird. and takes some getting used to, especially if you're like an organizer or planner type, and you're like, this isn't what I thought I need to adjust. That's me. I feel that. But waiting is such a necessary part. I think about Jesus in the New Testament, and we read about his birth, and we read about the first you know, few years of his life, and we read it like 11, 12, a story about him teaching in the temple, right? And he's like, all these scholars are amazed at this 12-year-old kid's talking with all this wisdom. Jesus is 12 years old, and he's teaching deep truths to these scholars. And then... Nothing is said. There's one verse in Luke that talks about all of the years between 12 and 30 of Jesus' life. And it says, in those years, Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and favor in the eyes of both God and men. That's it. You gave me one sentence to yada, 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 20 years of Jesus' life? Like, that's basically what you did. You just fast-forwarded it. That's a waiting period. Can you imagine Jesus being in the temple teaching at 12, thinking, I got it, let's go. And then it's like, you ain't ready yet. And I'm not saying that Jesus is like, you know, presumptuous and I don't want to oversimplify Jesus' emotions or guess at that, but even Jesus had to wait. Is that whole. If at 12 he's already speaking with the depth of knowledge to impress scholars and then he doesn't show up again and say anything again that's recorded at least until 30, you're telling me for 18 years Jesus had to wait to publicly start his ministry. And I can't wait a couple of months 
to see what God does in a situation in my life or a couple of years, right? The Savior of the world had a waiting period in which he grew in wisdom, stature, and favor. So what am I doing? And that's maybe where we wrap it up today. And, and what I want you to do is I want you to personalize it. If you've got something to write on, if you're a note taker, this would be perfect. If not, you can type it in your phone or if you remember things, just, you know, remember it. Um, but I want you to bow your heads and I want you to close your eyes. And you don't necessarily have to close your eyes, but I want you to get into a posture of kind of prayer and introspection. Get, get to a place mentally where you can think. And Evie, if you've got any, like, light instrumental background, this would be the time for it. I want you to think about what is it that comes to mind? What season of your life, what thing in your life right now is in a waiting period, is in a holding pattern? Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your life. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a tax return. I don't know. Maybe it's a, you know, something. We all have seasons of our life that we feel like, okay, well, I'm just waiting right now. And the most frustrating thing is when we're waiting on something we can't control. You know what I mean? If it's something we can do or something we can make happen, that's one thing. But when I have to wait on other people, good Lord, right? When it's out of my hands. So what's, what is that thing that you're waiting on? I want you to write it down. I want you to think about it. I want you to picture it. I want you to type it in your phone, whatever. And then I want you to do, or what I want you to do next is I want you to think about or maybe write out what it is you think God has told you about this season. So if you're in a job right now and you know that's not the job or the thing that God has for you, you go, okay, well, I'm waiting on this, this new career. I'm waiting on this new opportunity. So in this season, what God has told me is to wait and what God has told me is to, I don't know, learn what I can. Or in this season, you know, we're, we're waiting on, um, I don't know, I'm waiting on somebody to move out of my house or I'm waiting on someone to move from one state to another, whatever. And you're like, okay, I'm waiting on this. So in this season, what can I do to be productive? Can I, what can I do to be active? What can I do to be healthy here and now? Not necessarily to make it happen, not necessarily to change the situation and not let God do it, but what can I do in this season of waiting? I've been praying about something for years and I've just been waiting on God to, to do a miracle, waiting on God to create breakthrough, waiting on God to change something. And I haven't seen it yet. I know he will. So in this moment, I'm just going to be thankful. I'm just going to be grateful. I'm going to be the most dedicated, the most committed, the most hope filled, the most faith encouraging, whatever. I'm going to just go above and beyond to walk in such an attitude of thanksgiving for what God has done in my life, even if I haven't seen the very thing I've been waiting on. I'm going to be the most thankful person I can be. And let that be in spite of the thing that I'm waiting on. Or I'm, in this season, I'm going to encourage other people. 100% of my time, I'm going to pick a new person to just text or email or whatever, encourage every day. In this season, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn. Maybe I'm waiting on God to propel me into the new level or a new section or new job or new career. And so I'm just going to learn everything I can. I'm going to read. I'm going to write. I'm going to grow. I'm going to listen to podcasts. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to soak up everything I can in this season, you know, to, to be as prepared as I can. I don't know what it'll look like. I don't know exactly what I'll need. But I figure if I just put things into my heart, into my soul, then he'll know what to do with them. Sometimes maybe it's just build disciplines. God, I know that you're going to have a new season for me, and it's going to be crazy. It's going to be chaos. It's going to be awesome, but it's going to be flying. So in this season, I'm going to build some disciplines. I'm going to set a, de a dedicated time that I get up every morning to spend time with you. I'm going to start a reading pattern and build habits so that when things do get crazy, I have structure to fall back on. I'm going to build the structure now to support what you're going to put in my life later. Maybe that's it. Reality is, each and every one of us are waiting in some area, and in that area, there's something we can actively be doing. So write it out. 
Don't let yourself off the hook. Don't let yourself forget about it. Get in your car, go eat lunch, get stuck at the light, yell at somebody, I don't know, and just forget about it. Just think, oh, that was a nice thought, and it just stayed there. Write down, what can I do in this season? What opportunity do I have right now in this waiting season that I won't have in the next season? If God were to come through with that job, you know what I wouldn't be able to do? I wouldn't be able to do this. So in this season, I'm going to get that done. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that you give us opportunities. Because that's what they are, is opportunities in our waiting period, in our waiting season. To do things we've never done before, to grow, to, to renew our strength, to see things your way. Even if it's not the way that we think, even in that the Isaiah verse, you said to, to fly, to run, and then to walk, which feels backwards. It should be run, walk, you know, walk, run, fly. But it's backwards in this way, meaning it's not going to be the way our logic would tell us that it should be. And yet, it doesn't matter if it's you. As long as if it's you, then that's all. You just have to trust. Let us learn to wait well. Let us learn to be active and productive and encouraging and hopeful and alert in this season of waiting. And God, let us remember that sometimes the most encouraging thing we can do is be an encouragement to someone else, is to tell someone else that this season is good and God is with them especially when we feel like we need it most. When we feel like we need the most encouragement and most hope, help us to turn and be that to someone else. We thank you, God, that you never leave us or you forsake us. You're always with us. And oftentimes when you're silent, you are the most active. encouragement, you know? Um, in fact, before you leave, this is officially the dismissal, but before you leave, find somebody in the room, maybe the person next to you, and just tell them something nice and encouraging. That may seem cheery or cheesy or whatever, but you know what I mean? Sometimes what you think is cheesy is exactly what the other person needs to hear. So just tell them something nice. God loves them. It's going to be okay. You're going to make it through this. You know, fill in the blank. Maybe tell them what you hope somebody tells you. Sometimes that's the most prophetic thing you can do. It's like, I just want you somebody to give me a hug. Okay, then give them a hug, right? Just take a moment to impart something to the person next to you. Tell them it's going to be okay and that the season won't be forever. And uh, you guys have a great